au niveau des images, nous avons un exemple où il y a des chiffres et il y a des lettres qui apparaissent. Pour la vidéo, c'est idem. Mais ce qui est très important à noter, que ces codes sont tellement uniques et nous ne pouvons pas non plus modifier. La raison est simple, pour qu'il y ait une bonne traçabilité par la suite. Au niveau des laboratoires, qu'est-ce que nous on a pensé et fait Ces images qui étaient prises au niveau du microscope, c'est pour chaque patient, à chaque visite, que nous devons avoir et les images et les photos. Au niveau des laboratoires, on demandait maintenant à créer et à maintenir un registre pour tous les patients avec leurs codes et avec les différentes visites de suivi. Et là, on a donné un exemple. À la colonne A, vous voyez, il y a le numéro du patient, ce sont des codes. À la colonne B, ce sont les numéros de photos. À la colonne C, le numéro de vidéos. Et à la colonne D, c'est le numéro de visite, comme on en a plusieurs visites. La visite des trois mois et la présélection, la visite des trois mois, des six mois, des douze mois, des dix-huit mois. Pour qu'il n'y ait pas confusion, chaque visite doit avoir un code et ce code doit être relié avec un patient de l'éternel. Ainsi, à la fin, on doit faire maintenant ce transfert de vidéos et photos auprès des investigateurs ainsi que ces registres que les laboratoires ont mis en place. Dès que ça arrive au niveau des médecins investigateurs, c'est là il va créer maintenant des sous-dossiers de chaque patient. Et là, on a donné un exemple. Les patients 607001, si on veut prendre maintenant les codes et les numéros de vidéos et photos, on va relier maintenant les 607001, sa visite de 12 mois, V12M, avec tout ce qui est le numéro de vidéos et des photos. Et puis, il va maintenant sauvegarder ces vidéos dans cette bibliothèque électronique. L'exemple que nous avons donné, nous prenons l'exemple d'un site qui est en RDC 007 qui correspond à Mouchi. Là, on voit directement les patients 607 001. Si on ouvre dans ce sous-fichier, on va trouver les numéros de visite, on va trouver aussi les numéros de vidéos et photos s'il y en a. Donc ainsi de suite, c'est vraiment pour qu'il y ait une bonne traçabilité des différents patients. Alors, l'utilisation facile. Pour qu'il y ait une bonne traçabilité ou la transmission, et parfois il y a eu aussi des problèmes que nous avons connus où il y a une faible connexion de l'Internet, et tous ces éléments doivent être maintenant transmis dans les CRF. Et les parfois qui ne servaient pas seulement uniquement pour garder ou sauvegarder les vidéos et les photos, mais ça devait être aussi mis dans les, les CRF. Ainsi que la transmission des photos et des vidéos. L'exemple que nous avons donné avec cette carte SD, toutes les données sont là-dedans, et que dès que quelqu'un qui est à Genève ou à Kinshasa soit dans, au niveau du site, on clique au niveau des sites et les patients, le numéro des patients, on va voir tous ces éléments qui vont apparaître. Pour qu'il y ait effectivité de ce que nous venons de dire, il a fallu que bien bien puisse mettre en place un système de connexion à l'Internet. Comme vous le savez, ces études cliniques se passent dans des milieux ruraux. Il a fallu maintenant que les sites soient connectés avec l'Internet. Et au niveau du Kitsasa, là où nous sommes basés, nous avons au temps réel les données, dès qu'on synchronise euh, cet adolescent Paul Fadel, de visualiser, de voir et de valider les diagnostics. Et au même moment, en Europe, ici au niveau du Dianidia, partout, celui qui a cet outil peut aussi vérifier et ensemble on peut confirmer les diagnostics. En conclusion, cet outil n'est pas venu d'hasard. En 2013, il y a eu un comité de l'OMS qui s'était réuni. Là, ils ont parlé comment contrôler et faire la surveillance de du sommet. Et le comité a préféré aussi qu'il y ait vraiment un bon contrôle. Et c'est là où il y a eu cette idée aussi de faire ce contrôle et d'évaluer aussi 
nos malades que nous avons inclus. Les Paul Fader et cette microscopie, ces microscopes à caméra, c'est facile aussi à utiliser au niveau de nos sites. Tous les sites qui peuvent faire les essais cliniques peuvent facilement utiliser parce que ce n'est pas vraiment si difficile. Et cet outil peut servir aussi pour confirmer les diagnostics et pourquoi pas faire un lit de qualité, des données, et en même temps un bon outil pour la formation des lab tech. Parce que comme vous le savez, nous ne pouvons pas faire la ponction de mère à tout patient. Il y a des nouveaux personnels qui arrivent au niveau des hôpitaux. Nous ne pouvons pas d'emblée faire des ponctions de mère, mais avec cet outil, avec comme c'est codé, ils ne verront pas jamais le nombre de malades, mais nous pouvons faire des exercices à l'aide de cet outil pour voir si les techniciens peuvent bien compter les gobies blancs ou peuvent mettre en évidence les, les, les dépendances. Mais il y a une grande limitation dans cet outil que nous avons noté, cet outil ne peut jamais faire un diagnostic pour les cas négatifs. Nous avons parlé que des cas positifs. Et d'emblée, il n'y a aucune garantie de cet outil pour que ça soit mis en évidence. Je terminerai ma présentation en remerciant d'abord Diane et tous les partenaires que nous avons mis en place. Ce sont eux qui nous ont aidés à, à travailler pour venir en bout. Et avant de dire quoi que ce soit, je veux que vous puissiez me permettre pendant quelques deux ou trois minutes de visualiser euh, comment nous sommes arrivés à, à mettre en évidence. Là, vous voyez, il y a un trypanosome qui est là. Si vous le voyez bien, c'est à ce moment-là que les techniciens peuvent faire une vidéo de 2 à 5 secondes. Et donc il suffit seulement de voir les téponosomes. Alors nous allons euh, passer dans le cycle ganglionnaire. Voilà. Nous allons passer dans le cycle ganglionnaire pour voir comment les téponosomes, vous voyez, il y a un téponosome qui est ici, il y a l'autre qui est là. Il suffit de prendre seulement 2 à 5 secondes et d'envoyer afin que tout le monde soit dans une canon. C'était un bon diagnostic qu'on a posé pour. La THA. Je dis et je vous remercie. Well, we move to, it's not a neglected tropical disease or accepted as such huh, by the ratio of hepatitis C, but it's certainly a neglected condition in many countries. Um, and we are talking now about the deployment of diagnostic tools. Please, uh, Beatrice, uh, you have the floor. Okay, good afternoon everybody and thank you for the introduction and the great name tag. So I'm Beatrice Vetter, I am the scientific officer for HCV at FIND and um, as Francois mentioned, I'm here on behalf of Francesco Marinucci who is the head of the HIV HCV program um, at FIND and he sends his sincere apologies that he can't be here in person today. So over the next few minutes, I want to give you an introduction to FIND's hepatitis C program activities. Um, which center around enabling efficient um, diagnostic uh, tools and clinical care pathways for hepatitis C um, from the angle of polyvalent, polyvalent platform sharing, so having different diseases diagnosed on the same platform in pre-existing healthcare facilities um, with the aim to achieve wide healthcare coverage um, and 
could this be, uh, for one, also improve hepatitis C diagnostics and linkage to care, but also be a model to be applied to other diseases? So the WHO has set the goal of combating, combating uh, hepatitis C and B also to reach elimination by 2030. Of course, this requires access to hepatitis C diagnosis, care and treatment. And really, hepatitis C testing is the major barrier at the moment. Um, and the global burden is outlined very briefly and obviously here. So we have around 70 million um, chronically infected hepatitis C carriers globally of which it is really the, the great majority are not aware of their infection. And when it comes to patients on treatment, numbers are um, not very well defined, and particularly in the low and middle income countries, these are likely to be close to zero. So what does it take, defined by the WHO, to reach elimination? Well, the aims are that around 90% of infected patients are diagnosed, and 80% of those eligible patients are on treatment. Uh, it requires a reduction in HCV-related death, or it will lead to a reduction, um, and basically also to a dramatic uh, reduction of new infections in the future. It sounds easy, but why is it not so easy? Well, often at country levels, the, uh, the leadership and the commitment is uneven. So there, there might be some programs in place, um, but uh, because any program requires the buy-in of multiple stakeholders at multiple levels, it needs an alignment, it needs a clear leadership um, and a clear mission. There's limited coverage of rare hepatitis programs. We all know that there, are many, there has been a lot of effort going into HIV program and TB program, for example, work for hepatitis C that um, is yet to be built in many countries that lacks access to diagnostics and treatment. Um, and there's not really a public health approach um, as such yet to raise public awareness um, and communication about the potential of being infected. So hence, most people actually are unaware of their status. So overall, there are really four key dimensions needed to easily and affordably diagnose patients with new and current diagnostics. So the first one really is the point of entry, is the simplification of the testing algorithm. And that is not only the algorithm in terms of how to determine and confirm an initially reactive screening test, but it's also making those diagnostics easier to use, making them uh, available, you know, easy, accessible, um, and affordable. So this is uh, to the right, you just see this, and you're not meant to read it, but it basically is an outline of the complications that can happen during hepatitis C diagnosis and the complex pathway. However, it doesn't stop here. Um, what is also really important probably to achieve um, the, the elimination and the diagnosis that is needed is to differentiate across the different health systems and populations, because there are so many different uh, patient groups affected, and they go to different clinics, etc. And often the countries have a one-size-fits-all approach. So they say, if there's a hepatitis C program, there's an approach saying, OK, this is what you do with your patients. You screen them. Do you send them to a hospital for referral or et cetera? And then maybe they get treatment based on those conditions, et cetera. But actually, that may not fit very well, because people who are affected by hepatitis C, they go to things like harm reduction sites or primary health care centers, ARV clinics. Uh, they are sex workers or, or prison inmates. And all these different settings probably require a little bit more of a tailor-made approach. And here, of course, comes the question, which one is the best, which is um, what we're also uh, looking at. Um, and the other two areas are really the integration and the decentralization. So integration refers to two things. So for one, it is leveraging on existing health programs that use uh, a platform to diagnose hepatitis C and make that, but that platform can also diagnose hepatitis C, uh, and it does HIV maybe and other diseases, to link those programs together um, and also integrate multiple services together. But also it's a decentralization. So of course, if the patient is not coming to wherever the test is, you need to go and reach out to the patient with point of care um, tests and, for example, dried blood, spot, um, dried blood spot sample collection. So now we come to the FIND activities. So um, through funding from UNITAID, uh, FIND has put together the Head Start program, which stands for Hepatitis C Elimination Through Access to Diagnostics. And this is meant to bridge the gap between R&D and country adoption. So it has two sides to it, basically um, categorized into those four activities that we want to accelerate and enable the development of 
diagnostics that are really fit for purpose to reach all sorts of affected populations in low and middle income countries, um, but also work together with uh, the people on the ground, the policy makers and the implementers to actually have it adopted in a tailor-made approach. And you can see here uh, the, those four sort of the purple boxes as a heading, so basically the activities focus around increasing access to quality assured, uh, rapid diagnostic tests, expanding the use of co-antigen tests with, with as many advantages, um, which I'm not going to go into here, um, but also decentralizing of HCV diagnosis through point of care um, and platform polyvalence, as well as integration and outreach through the blood spot sampling. So what are we doing on the Head Start program? It really is bringing new products and tools to the market but also establish evidence required for those new products to be used in a variety of settings. And earlier on, I was uh, talking about the um, sort of not one size fits all purpose, but tailor made. And um, in the next couple of slides, I want to give you two examples that we are currently evaluating in target countries uh, that we're piloting different diagnostic and linkage to care cascades um, with certain outcome measurements to see which ones work best to make them available then appropriately. So basically in the country number one example here, we have a current status at a harm reduction site where they do have uh, rapid tests for HCV screening, but then the patient or, um, is referred for, if that is initially reactive, to get an HCV RNA test um, and afterwards at uh, the, the other facility uh, probably a hospital or a larger healthcare entity to receive the treatment if eligible. So this is really based on patient self-referral and you, of course here the linkage to care, I mean you can imagine it is difficult if it's based on patient care, so there are, there's definitely the risk that the linkage to care doesn't work very well here. However, people are coming to the harm reduction sites and these are people who uh, have a high likelihood to be hepatitis C positive because they fall into that risk group. So what are we doing in the fine pilot project? We have uh, two arms uh, established in harm reduction sites. One where, um, the one to the left, where basically everything is on site. You have your rapid diagnostic test, you have a um, HCV RNA test, and there's treatment available. And of course here, because the harm reduction site is not a well-equipped laboratory, the RNA test uh, needs to be point of care. So this is one of our uh, development efforts also, going, linking basically the R&D side together with the um, patient flow, kind of hopefully uh, treatment cascade policy work. So that is one thing. And then we compare that to another harm reduction site uh, where they get the RDTs on site. And then there is the sample referral to a centralized uh, laboratory where the core antigen is uh, measured, which is a lot cheaper and faster in, in turnaround times compared to the RNA. And as well, there's treatment available. And um, so basically, the outcomes that are measured is basically that, that on a broader scale is numbers of patients linked to care, because if we compare those three settings to each other, um, there might be a difference, because that is kind of the, the, the idea behind it, that the linkage to care, um, there might be better, better ways than the current existing systems. And this is also, of course, uh, based on the number of patients with confirmed diagnosis, number of patients on treatment, cost per diagnosis, very important, and time to initiate the treatment. So further on, once this is established and there's uh, then di um, dialogue going on with, uh, within the country and uh, sort of more on the policy level, it can then be thought of basically depending on the geographic lo location and the size of the, uh, the harm reduction site, that each site will adopt a different model of care. So not the one size fits all which they had in the previous slide in the black box, which is currently ongoing, regardless of number of patients, uh, location, um, and I don't know, equipment of the site, for example, or staff uh, trained or not, then the, the country might be able to, have, according to a preset definition, to say, okay, here we know in this harm reduction site, algorithm number one will work best, but in another one, algorithm number two works best because a centralized hospital is really close or, or whatever. And here you can also see a third example where basically the treatment is then also given at the harm reduction site. Um, which is also like a sub-arm um, of, of what we're trying to evaluate currently. The second example um, focuses on uh, established district and tertiary hospitals, where they actually currently don't do um, frequent HCV screening. However, they have a, if you can see these three hospitals here, a TB clinic, 
and an ART clinic, as well as a tertiary hospital with a central laboratory. So here we have the idea of integration, okay? Um, and uh, also it's important to note, of course, the TB clinic is under a TB program, so there's TB funding. The ART clinic is under an AIDS program, so it's AIDS funding. Um, but actually, you know, the clinics, they're well capable of diagnosing another infectious disease. So basically here, we are providing the clinics with HIV rapid diagnostic tests for patients who come in for their TB or ART or other testing. Um, and then also have on site the HCV RNA testing, also in a, uh, in a sort of point of care or benchtop type uh, manner. Um, and then make available the treatment if the patients are eligible. So basically here really it's leveraging on the existing um, abilities and resources that are there and knowledge and uh, know-how to also capture those who are at high risk of having an HCV infection. And the outcome measures, again, are pretty much the same. If we look at linkage to care, confirmed diagnosis, I mean, here, of course, it's slightly uh, amended because those hospitals did not actually do uh, routine HCV screening, um, but nevertheless, the same outcomes still apply to see which model works well under which circumstances. And in the end, at least to the same as, as on the previous uh, example, country example, that basically depending again on the geographic location, the health facility, the types of patients they see, uh, the types of uh, techniques and technologies they have available, then the country recommendation can go out to adopt different scenarios of HCV screening and linkage to care. So really, I mean, it sounds pretty simple, but of course here we have a whole range of, of, of uh, entities involved. So um, it's of course here the testing and the laboratory abilities. But then it goes into the service integration of HCV care and treatment into the existing health infrastructure and the programmatic integration with broad sharing of system and processes that planning logistics and also the human resource level. And I'm sure you're all well aware that for this, many, many stakeholders are involved depending on where you are and which program it is. But it is those people who actually do the work on the ground all the way up to the policy makers. And really this is also the aim of the Head Start program to for one, provide the diagnostics, make them available, but also then find the most effective, tailor-made kind of approach, how to use them in different sites and for different target populations, and ultimately discuss with program organizers and in the national framework how this can be sustainably rolled out in the country. And this is a slide actually from the, the WHO, uh, that it basically the, the HCV epidemic will result in a progressive realization of universal health coverage. So current coverage, of course, is, is limited, um, but with all these activities and depending on the population um, and the costs and the services available, there's uh, a huge gap that needs to be bridged, but also a lot of potential in there. And lastly, uh, I want to thank uh, our donors, particularly Unitaid, uh, who is the major donor for this Head Start program um, at FIND. Thank you. Thank you very much. So please stay here, keep the questions for the end. We have one more presentation on a very innovative approach to try to gather additional information on epidemiology of snake bites and the dis distribution of venomous snakes. Um, you know that snake bite has been reintroduced finally as an official neglected tropical disease in the WHO list uh, last year. It's very clearly deserved. It shares all the characteristics of an NTD. Um, and I'm really happy that uh, Lester Geneviève is coming today to present this, uh, I think, very innovative approach. Thank you, Lester. Please come in. Good afternoon, everyone. For the past two years, I have been fascinated by these innovative, participatory research methods directly involving the citizens in for data collection. I'm currently a PhD candidate at the University of Basel now, investigating the ethical dimensions of such systems. 
However, my passion started with his project at the Institute of Global Health in Geneva. So I'm more than happy to share with you my past research work on how the active involvement of individuals, communities, and the use of open data can be applied to the snake bite crisis. This highly interdisciplinary work was feasible thanks to the substantial contributions made by my fellow colleagues representing the following institutions. Here is the, the agenda for my presentation, and now let's <laughs> dig deeper into the snake bite and venomine. Snake bite and venomine affects many poor and rural communities in developing countries. These countries have both ha the highest venomous snake diversity and the highest burden of snake bite due to limited medical expertise and limited access to antivenoms. These impressive snake bite mortality and morbidity figures led MSF to call it a super NTD, and as uh, Francois mentioned, led to its reintroduction in the NTD list of the WHO last year. We hope that the renewed political momentum will help to face the current antivenom crisis in Africa and promote the training of medical staff. In the past, the WHO made some progress in the fight against snake bite. In 2010, 219 medically important venomous snake species were mapped based on published uh, reference texts, scientific literature, museum collection databases, and experts' opinions. These maps are key in identifying at-risk populations and providing life-saving care where most needed. However, snake ecology is complex and our understanding of a geographical distribution is still limited given the current global anthropogenic changes such as climate change. In such a dynamic context, new approaches based on citizen participation and the increasing pervasiveness of mobile technologies could offer an additional source of valuable data to be further exploited. Our objectives were to be the first global observational map of these MIVS species based on crowdsourced citizen and scientist generated observations. Secondly, to identify data gaps in the distribution, and lastly, to discuss the significance of these participatory approaches and open data in MIVS ecology and the subsequent application to more targeted public health interventions. So to achieve our objectives, on the 4th of February to last year, we created a project on iNaturalist, which is one of the most important citizen science platforms dedicated to biodiversity, biodiversity and which had at the time more than 4 million observations. And in just 12 days, we gathered more than 8,000 georeference MIVS observations of research grade quality. <coughs> Additionally, observation MIVS data sets were also downloaded from two open massive biodiversity platforms, namely GBIF and Vernet, which all together had more than 800 million observations. These two platforms received their inputs mainly from professional sources, such as universities, research institutions, and government agencies. Here is a small schema representing the distribution of observations between the two data set that we created for this study. Concerning the results, so scientists, citizen and scientists generated observations included respectively 56 and 81 percent of species listed by WHO as MIVS and covered 96 and 137 countries from all GBD regions of the world. With these gathered snake observation data sets, we built this global observational map. As you can see on the left here, these green dots represent observations contributed by citizens, <coughs> and the blue dots those from scientists, and the color scale here illustrates the number of deaths per GVD regions annually. As you can see, you can find observations on all continents. However, which is striking here is the strong geographical bias that was high income North America which concentrates more than 79% of all citizen observations and more than 34% of all scientists' observations. 
And also you can see despite having very low snake bite mortality rate, less than 10 deaths annually. However, severely affected regions such as Eastern and Western Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia only accounted for 5% of these observations. So clearly, uh, data is lacking where the crisis is higher. We also wanted to go a bit further by quantifying the uh, level of agreement between the two types of observations to assess the qualitative and quantitative value of contributions made by citizens. To reduce the geographical bias, we focus on the United States, and we did find a positive correlation between the two, and that 64% of them identify the same MIVS species. Additionally, we also found that around 97% of the four most frequently observed snake species from citizens were within the known geographical range in the US, as you can see with this figure. So what is the added value of such participatory approaches? First of all, they will allow a better understanding of snake ecology and snake bite ecoepidemiology and their adaptations to global anthropogenic changes. Interestingly, we will notice that observations made by citizens came not only from wild uh, habitats, but also from urban regions. As you can see here, this is a satellite image of the city of Houston, and these are all contributions made by citizens. These could be used to complement efforts made by experts whose data collections are frequently bound to specific regions, species, and periods of a year, depending on their research objectives. Citizen science projects could also gather additional data on snake bite induced mobility and loss of productivity in a relatively easy and cost effective way. The gathered photos from citizens are also valuable material for machine learning systems based on computer vision, offering interesting opportunities as a medical decision support tool. I will cover this a little bit later in the presentation. So what are the challenges of participatory approaches in more targeted public health interventions? First of all, which is quite obvious, the accessibility to web-based technologies is still problematic in poor regions. Secondly, we are faced with sociocultural, political, and logistical challenges which may limit the implementation of these participatory approaches. The literacy level also could be an issue. For instance, in Africa, 38% of the African population is non-literate. And one of the biggest challenges is how do we sustain the motivation of participants? Administering the correct antivenom can literally make a difference between life and death of snake bite victims. Since many antivenoms are monovalent, that is, they are species specific, the correct identification of a biting snake is paramount. So to take the advantage of the pervasiveness of mobile technologies around the world, we hereby propose the first medical decision support tool for snake identification based on artificial intelligence and remote collaborative expertise. This project is being uh, funded by the Fondation Privée des Assujets. And the objective of this, uh, sorry, the objective of this app will be to improve the clinical management of snake bite in poor countries with high snake bite mortality rate and burden by helping physicians and other healthcare professionals, for example, local practitioners, the SUG, MSF in the field, as well as snake bite victims in the identification of the biting snakes. I thank you for your attention. Okay. Um, I would like to call all the speakers uh, to come and, um, and sit here, and then I open the floor to questions. <coughs> Speak loud. I will repeat the question. 
and to um, because of the live uh, broadcast. Roberto, yes. Uh, whatever. Avant que vous répondiez, je vais euh, euh, traduire la, la question. Euh, en fait, la traduire pour l'audience qui ne parle pas français. Uh, let me translate the question, which is not the easiest one to translate. In fact, um, so the question is: um, How would you uh, translate this uh, technology of, you know, making pictures and also shooting videos uh, for? not only for CSF microscopy, but also for the microscopy of, uh, um, of blood by the, uh, through the mini colon and also the mini hematocrit uh, uh, techniques to find the trypanosomes in the blood. Um, have you tested this technique on that? Um, uh, are you shooting videos also to find the trypanosome uh, in the blood? On peut utiliser aussi ces techniques pour chercher les trypanosomes dans le sang, dans les mini-colonnes ou les, 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 mini, les tubes de mini-hématocrite avec l'utilisation de vidéos. Oui. Euh, Merci pour la, la question. Et vous avez bien défini que c'était difficile et pour visualiser les trypanosomes. Et là, je suis d'accord avec vous. Et c'est possible aussi lorsque nous avons bien expliqué les, les vidéos que nous avons prises, c'est soit dans les cycles ganglionnaires, soit dans les liquides céphalo-rachidiens. Alors, pour les photos, on ne prend que les photos pour les globules blancs. Alors, c'est vrai, il est possible de les faire comme vous avez dit. Rien. C'est comme ça que nous avons dit dans notre conclusion que l'OMS, lors de cette réunion, avait des difficultés pour vous dire comment nous pouvons contrôler la maladie du sommeil pendant que cette prévalence de la maladie diminue. Et l'outil que nous avons mis en place va servir vraiment de confirmer et de traiter réellement les patients qui sont malades. La difficulté, je vous comprends par rapport à... à, à à une zone du point endémicité, que ce soit une zone qui a une endémicité très élevée, mais la difficulté, il faut bien dire que non, non, avec l'agrandissement dix fois, vous avez cette chance de voir les trypanosomes. À 40 fois, vous agrandissez, mais vous avez la moindre possibilité. Mais comme il y a l'écran et que nous avons la possibilité vraiment de visualiser et de prendre que cette séquence-là, donc, c'est possible de le faire. Je ne sais pas si je réponds à votre préoccupation. Ok, merci. Thank you. Other question? Yes, please. Yes. Yes. Uh, the, uh, Madame Anne Crétin. Okay. 
could you repeat because so, it was so long? Um, the, the, could you speak a bit louder for the first part of your question, please? Okay. The first Sorry. part. Sorry. Second okay. part, I can, I can repeat. I wanted to know. Yes. In the proposal, I mean, part of what is done uh, for clinician, uh, what would be the, the output that we find in the end product? Will it be numeric, like the measurement of the size of the bed? Will it be graphical, like what you project that is the output? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or will it be imagery, like what you did from sonography? Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, mm -hmm. the second okay. question is that um, what will be a gold standard for the study, like comparison to this? Okay. And this is what I'm projecting. Okay. Ok, alors je vais peut-être le traduire en français puisqu'on l'a bien entendu en anglais. Euh, donc la première question c'est comment le résultat est rendu par la machine Est-ce qu'elle est rendue sous forme numérique, sous la forme d'un graphe ou euh, sous la forme euh, de la troisième forme que vous aviez The third form you were... image. Ah oui, image. Alors, une image, sous forme d'image. Ça c'est le premier volet de la question et le deuxième volet c'est dans l'évaluation finalement de la performance diagnostique de l'outil pour savoir si l'adulte, le verre adulte est vivant ou mort, quel est le standard de référence, le gold standard que vous utilisez So for, for the first question, uh, the results that uh, we, we will provide is the, is the composition of the nodule, that is uh, so, some numerical, some numbers uh, that should, uh, should be representative of the composition of um, tissue inflammatory and uh, inflammatory tissue, sorry, uh, collagen and, and worms. That is um, a kind of characterization of the collagen, for example. So it's not an image. And it's uh, because uh, when the nodule is degenerating, the structure of the nodule is changing, and especially the collagen around the worm, for example. And since the structure modifies, the diffusion coefficient that we measure is going to, to modify also. So we, we will provide a variation of diffusion coefficient Uh, that will be representative of the degradation of the nodule. I, I'm not, uh, did I answer to the first question? Yeah. And, and for the second one, we used a three reference diagnosis method. One is uh, based on the enzymatic activity of the worm, and it's uh, called MTT. Uh, the second one was made based on the fertility of the worm, and that's on biograms. And the third one was um, uh, in histology. So each time for each nodule, we compared our result with uh, the, this uh, diagnostic uh, reference tool. Do you, uh, you have another question? Yes. This one is for the citizen, uh, citizen Could science. you speak louder, please? Okay, for you, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> But you can relax. I'm uh, um, looking for this name. We talked about snake, snake um, epidemiology. Uh -huh. Yes, the information. Mm -hmm. So, my, my question is that um, what is your vision? in its application in other uh, infectious conditions, like you're talking about um, GIT or uh, respiratory infection. How do you see it being transmitted in that direction from your observation in the studies just the, the, the question is, uh, really can this uh, participatory approach and citizen science could be useful also to gather information and data for other, for other conditions mm -hmm. such as infectious diseases mm -hmm. uh, like diarrheal disease or respiratory tract infections or that kind of uh, uh, conditions. Okay, but uh, for this question, I mean, it's already been done in Europe. It could be also be applied to these uh, uh, middle and lower income <coughs> countries. If you take the example of Influenza Net, which is like a platform used for monitoring the influenza like in 
illness activity in Europe. So it's basically the same principle where you use citizens and web-based technologies to find hotspots of uh, influenza outbreaks. And then you can also tackle the situation with more vaccination in these regions and also promote more uh, preventive uh, uh, solutions to uh, these people. But uh, for snake bite, what was interesting about application was uh, it will rely on artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques. So I don't think this could be applied to infectious disease now, but uh, still, uh, I'm not an expert in the field. Thank you. Thank you. Gabriel? Yes, hello, I'm Gabriel Arcova from MSF and Sujet. Um, question for Lester, of course, <laughs> State Bike, of course. And uh, my question is uh, mainly looking at the maps, we've seen that, uh, I mean, looking at uh, mm. three approaches and citizen science, rich countries are overrepresented, and as we know, more than 120,000 people die of snake bites uh, every mm -hmm. year. And the mapping in Africa and uh, South Asia is probably lacking of it, or is disproportionate. Uh, so my question is, in which hands should we put the app, the, the snake app that you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Should it be in laymen, health workers, or in uh, district hospitals? Mm -hmm. Okay, before you answer, you know, I'm supposed to okay. repeat. Uh, <laughs> it's not that your English is not good. Uh, anyway, mine. Um, so the question uh, is, okay, there is a disproportion uh, in the participatory science between the North country and, uh, and the South. Now, this application that you do wish to design and develop um, as a recognition of a snake species, um, in which hand uh, would you like this, uh, this uh, future tool to be uh, given? Would be it for practitioners receiving patients with snake bite, or more upstream <coughs> uh, for community health workers, or for uh, you know health nurses working at the primary health care level? How would you see mm -hmm. the use of this uh, of this tool in the f I mean, provided that it is developed and and it is performant and usable? Okay. So this app should target multiple stakeholders, not just healthcare professionals, but also um, uh, the normal citizens going to the field, taking pictures of snakes. These uh, pictures being geolocalized, so we know where the snakes are. Uh, or we also this method of using machine learning techniques, so we are continually feeding images to the computer vision. At the same time, it gets better over time, and it will be more be able to identify the correct snake. And so it's just like a comprehensive approach uh, englobing all the different stakeholders, and not just healthcare professionals. I have a question to that, if, if I may. Yeah. So, so I was wondering, how did you promote the app? Because you had quite a good response, I think. Yeah. So how did you, what was your way of telling people that they should start taking pictures of the snakes and sending them? Uh, we didn't yet start it. It's just a pilot project that was going to be started uh, in the coming months. But our strategy was to look at all these different stakeholders first, and then we can find the best channel of communications and try to make it uh, implemented and widely accepted. Okay. Yeah, yeah in fact, uh, the, the, the results that were presented were already existing okay, that existing are found images. in existing yeah. platforms. Mm -hmm. um, the, the app is really a plan for the future or recognition of snake species. Ah, so I misunderstood. Yeah. Well, it was maybe yeah. some um, prototype or something, yeah. uh, but your plan would be to um, roll it out with some kind of... Um, promotion or awareness campaign, so to say. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thanks. Yes, Abby. Uh, on the same line, uh, on the technology that was used for snake bite, uh, it is high time that we use artificial intelligence machine learning to aid us to identify any. Uh, so in that regard, that would be the best way to go out. But my question is, since you are using uh, AI, uh, would the project include going the rest of the way, like developing algorithms to, to develop recommendations for management, uh, mm -hmm. uh, or does it stop just on identifying the state types and uh, uh, geographies? So the question is, uh, sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. 
um, is this uh, future application of a snake recognition will also include something beyond this, also re recommendations for physicians on uh, clinical management of, um, of, uh, of, of the snake by depending on the species that is it identified, you know, which anti-snake venom should be used and so on. Will this be integrated in the application? I know maybe, uh, let's say you may not be the best person to answer, but maybe yes. Raphael can also help you for this. Yeah, sure. You want to start? Or, uh, no, well, I think yeah, sure. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's quite a challenging time. Um, <laughs> Every, so, everyone knows each other. For sure, but I think it's, it's first of all, I think it's a two step process probably. So, so for sure, our initial challenge, I, I think actually a three step process. The first part of the process was the paper that just Les presented, the one that was just published recently in class, where we gather the images, existing images on these biodiversity platforms. Then the second step, I think, is really trying to set up this machine learning recognition system. So can we actually use a computer to identify images of snakes, which is a huge challenge by itself. And then the third step is once we, we are able to demonstrate that there is some real potential behind a computer and doing that, it's thinking bigger into a, a more clinical management decision support system. That, but that's, that's where we're heading, but, but it's really in the second <coughs> step at this moment. Yeah. Yes, Michaela. So I'm Michaela, I'm from uh, Sans Sans Frontières. I think we're coping a little bit uh, <laughs> with questions, but I think uh, entities are very much in our, in our heart. I'm trying to link Leicester with DIGAS, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And today you have a you have a library that's almost unique. You have information that probably no one in the world has. Have you thought? And and the second thing is you don't only have that, but we're getting less and less less lab experienced people in the world for this disease. Have you thought of how to? Yeah how to use artificial intelligence and machine learning for this purpose. Maybe you don't have the answer, but it's just a reflection. Right. Donc la, la, la réflexion qui est exprimée par Michaela là, de MSF est euh, est-ce que au-delà de donc ces photos et vidéos qui sont prises au microscope euh, pour le comptage cellulaire mais surtout pour la reconnaissance de trypanosomes Compte tenu du fait qu'avec la baisse de l'incidence de la maladie du sommeil, euh, eh bien le, le niveau d'expertise des techniciens de laboratoire va en moyenne baisser, est-ce qu'on pourrait imaginer appliquer euh, de l'intelligence voilà, de, de, artificielle et de la reconnaissance euh, digitale de ce qui est observé pour dire voilà c'est un trypanosome c'est pas un trypanosome donc pas seulement un œil expert mais vraiment euh, une reconnaissance digitale oh, oh, oh. Oh, oui merci beaucoup c'est ça c'était même l'objectif quand Dian Diaye a mis en place euh, cet outil c'était euh, pour qu'on soit sûr les patients que nous avons inclus comme c'est un essai clinique qu'ils ont réellement étaient malades et qu'ils ont pris les traitements. Au-delà de ça, il est possible, mais à ne pas oublier que même si l'incidence, la prévalence de la maladie diminue, les techniciens de laboratoire au niveau des structures fixes ou au niveau des équipes mobiles, à chaque fois, il y a toujours des partenaires qui nous aident pour des trainings. Parce que ce que tu dis là est vrai que lorsqu'il n'y a pas assez de cas, les personnels n'arrive pas non plus à être apte à poser des bons diagnostics. Là, nous le savons. Mais euh, digitaliser, oui, c'est possible, mais ce n'était pas vraiment euh, l'objectif que Diane a mis en place cet outil. Là, ça reste maintenant, nous, au niveau du programme, et si nous pouvons le faire. Voilà. Je ne sais pas, Olaf, tu as quelque chose à ajouter Oui. My name is Laura, a question for Beatrice about the design and how you're going to evaluate these different diagnostic strategies. Will it be in a randomized controlled trial type design that you can actually compare the different strategies between hospitals and find out what works best? And I ask that because I assume there's 
very different contexts in the different hospitals that you'll try, maybe even different um, access to treatment levels. Mm -hmm. So how would you design it? Yeah, for now I think it's, uh, it's based on monitoring, so there's a fixed amount of, uh, sorry, there's a a number of patients defined that uh, we want to want a number of time period and the number of patients we want to uh, receive during that time period, and then there are different outcome measures. So it's not really, um, as far as I, I, I see it now, it's not really a uh, randomized trial, but the patients, I mean, they do, of course, consent to taking part in that activity, um, but they're not actively recruited. They just come to these sites um, in general, yeah. Um, and it's based, yeah, on time and amount of patients. Mm -hmm. So if you measure time to treatment, how do you know that that time to treatment was decided by the diagnostic yeah. strategy implemented or by the myriad of other things? That no, those things would have then to be seen by a correlation in the end. Yeah, it's, of course, you, you cannot always necessarily, particularly if those things are sort of de decentralized, you know, one thing happens here and the other in a different uh, environment, uh, you cannot always necessarily link it or know exactly what kind of has happened in between, uh, um, but that would be based on the certain correlation. Mm. Thank you. I have a question for Anne. Um, is it thinkable to think, I mean, provided of course that uh, the tool will be validated as a reliable tool to assess the viability of the worm. Is it a field uh, design? I mean, is it, field, is it feasible to use the technology in the field? Uh, how, it, how big is the machine? How expensive is the technology? And, and so on. Well, well, you can see the optical probe in the exposition okay. over there. So it's, uh, it's just a, a little um, pen like this okay. that you put on, on the, pen. yes. So it, it has been designed to be u useful for, for palm groves or wh wherever in the, in the world with easy uh, components and easy to use. And, you know, using ultrasound for uh, lymphatic filariasis, we can see the worm dancing, huh? the dancing yes. worm sign in the lymphatic. So these uh, worms in the, these uh, female worms in the, in the nodules for Onkosaka, they are like lazy, they don't move. Uh, <laughs> so, so we cannot so. assess their viability by just uh, ultrasound. Uh, so they are almost static, and oh. only the head is moving, and the head is really thin, comparing to the, the, the whole body. So we, we are not able to see anything with ultrasound. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, sure. yes. uh, they have done the studies on ultrasound for nodules. Uh -huh. But it's not good enough because they are very packed and they don't move if they don't have enough space. So you cannot trust, it's not sensible enough. They're going to be alive and don't move. It's not like the PI attacks. Okay. Issue. Just like to complement the, the point of the NDI on this research, which is very useful for us, is because it can help us to decide when to take the nodule. Because the problem we have with the nodules is that you have only one shot. You take it out. And you, don't, you cannot follow the nodules. Once you take it and you analyze, you will lose it. So the, 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 the help of this technique also could be to help us to uh, evaluate along the trial. Since the beginning, every, you can have different measurements. And that is very, very innovative because now we don't have anything to, to follow the nodules along the trial. So maybe we can define the best moment to make the nodulectomy, mm. which is very useful for the clinical uh, design. Mm. That's one of the, mm. and can help to shorten the length of the trial, save safe uh, resources. Mm -hmm. It's one of the applications we, we want to use. Is there another question who popped in anyone's mind? because I have a whole list of them. Um, Lester, if we want to actively promote, um, you know, these uh, citizen science and uh, 
the participatory approach of citizens to take pictures of uh, snakes in nature, etc. Uh, doesn't it raise an ethical issue, you know, to uh, to you know for citizens to take picture of a dangerous uh, animal who can actually uh, bite the photographer um, <laughs> during uh, during the shooting? Thank you for this question, Francois. <laughs> <laughs> It's a very good one. The so last one I have for you. Yeah. yeah sure. Okay. Good. <laughs> actually, actually um, as you can see, the pictures that we gathered were already existing pictures. Yes. So people will normally encounter them in nature and just take a picture, <coughs> and that's it. And but if you want to really promote this kind of biospatial research, we need to make sure that people are trained when they encounter a snake, what they should do and what they should not do, and uh, what are the first aid techniques to be done if they are beaten, because we have seen in some countries, for instance in India, 90 to 98% of people use tourniquets when they are beaten, and we know that they are not effective, and they also cause a severe local tissue damage, like ischemia, gangrene, etc. So these are things that we should focus on, and at the same time, if we our citizens to engage in such activities, we have to think, take into consideration that when someone is beaten by a snake, usually bystanders try to kill the snake and bring it back to the practitioner for identification. But now they offer a safer opportunity by just taking a picture and preventing additional bite. So I think uh, the benefits well outweigh the risk in this case. Yes, please. Related, I think it would be very bad for the tourism industry in some of these regions to get high levels of reports of dangerous snakes. <laughs> How would you anticipate dealing with pushback from governments or um, mm. ministries who don't appreciate lots of these photos taken? I might disagree with you on this point because there's a lot of ecotourism and some people are just uh, enthusiastic about snakes. So. As you can see, we don't, need to, <laughs> we don't need to tell them to go after snakes, they just do it by, by themselves. But now we're providing guidance, and uh, we are harnessing all the photos that they are gathering to, for greater good. So I think uh, this should not be an issue uh, in this case. So maybe the ecotourists will balance out the beach goals. Exactly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's enthusiasm until the time you get it right. <laughs> Philip? Following on, on snake bites, but uh, on an app that is using artificial intelligence, what's the bandwidth that you need to have uh, to make this kind of, a, of device working? Because if you need a, if you need a 4G or 5G uh, mobile capacity, mm -hmm. where is it going to be available? And mm -hmm. is it really going to be available in the place that which are most in need? I mean, um, for me, I guess uh, the ultimate goal of this app is going to be like it could work even offline without uh, uh, internet coverage and then get updated when you have access to the internet. So that's one of the points that we are working on for this app. At the same time, um, we are just not only relying on artificial intelligence, but there's also a second branch concerning of uh, collaborative expertise where we'll have a group of herpetologists that could help also in uh, identification of a snake species. So it's just not the app, there's also a second validation by a group of experts behind. Plus, if I may comment on that, yes. actually we, we try to include three levels. So one level will be the machine, plus a selected group of experts, and there are very few actually around the world. Plus, we, what we're trying to measure now is really looking at how well the crowd does. So this group of enthusiasts and entomologists that just like to go during the weekends and same way they like to take a picture of birds, they also like to take a picture of snake, and that's, it's a reality. I mean, there are thousands of people online sharing a picture of this, so it's, it's a reality. And, and the idea is, can we actually test how well these thousands of people that just like snakes, how well they actually identify snakes? So can we challenge professional pathologists against and having a measure of that? I think we have the three levels to be quite powerful. Okay, I think um, I will conclude with a couple of thoughts. Um, first, um, okay, we have faced this fantastic revolution of, uh, you know, new treatment for hepatitis C, which is probably one of the biggest achievements in medicine in the last decade. 
uh, we have seen in the field of sleeping sickness these uh, new oral treatment that are uh, that are coming uh, soon um, and will soon be available but all these new treatments have only a meaning uh, if it goes along the simplified treatment have a meaning if it goes along a simplified diagnostic approach uh, and sometimes this is a bit of a neglect field neglected field the field of diagnosis and I'm happy to see in these four presentations they all have uh, something to do with development of new diagnostic approach sometimes firstly designed for to improve you know uh, reference standards or reliability of diagnosis within clinical trials but this is a first step that then may go to the development of a field usable uh, techniques for more like operational or uh, clinical use um, and this is what, in my opinion, links these uh, four presentations. I would like to really warmly thank the speakers uh, for having come to Geneva to this meeting to uh, show their, their work and also to have hold so well the time. Uh, and I would like to thank the audience for the good questions and the participation. And really, it's nice to see it's a significant audience for a session on NTD. So thank you very much to all. Thank you, and uh, enjoy your stay in Geneva.